Many people following comics today have probably never heard of cross-gen comics, although I'll bet most of this audience has. Cross-gen is an interesting story because it's difficult to talk about it in one sitting. There's a lot of different aspects to it, and in many ways it's a, it's a perfect illustration of what to do and what not to do simultaneously inside of comics. And the stories surrounding it and the people involved are you know, relatively legendary in trying to do the right things, but maybe having the wrong people and maybe running it the wrong way and having a little bit of bad luck and a lot. Cross-gen is, uh, well, we're going to get into cross-gen, but this is, this is going to be a tricky video to make. Hey everybody, this is Perch. Uh, Cross-gen is such an interesting topic because people uh, often like to tell you the real story of cross-gen. I think I've heard like five or six real stories of cross-gen from various places, all that have a few similarities and then a lot of differences in the back end. And uh, that the very fact that there is that kind of discrepancy kind of is part of the problem. It's part of what went wrong. But let, let me explain a little bit what cross-gen was. So CrossGen gets announced in 1998. It's a new comic company. And, and to put it in some perspective, the late 90s were, I don't want to say a death zone, but it was a bad time in comics. You had Marvel filing for bankruptcy. You had the uh, Heroes World debacle. You had a ton of comic stores going out of business because the, the, the whole business broke. It, uh, it all fell apart. And, we, you know, I've done other videos as to why it fell apart, and it's probably important that you kind of understand those to really get the sense of what was going on with CrossGen at the time. But the, the history here is that uh, there was a guy, uh, Mark Alessi, and he is a, he's a, he's a, I don't want to say a tech guy, but he's a, a rich kind of IT guy. And he makes a bunch of money off of Ross Perot by selling some assets to Ross Perot and his companies, and he gets, um, you know, a, a really, a really good chunk of change. And about the, the number is varied a little bit, but it kind of settles around $30 million. And, and Mark Alessi kind of comes to the conclusion that he wants to make a, um, you know, a, a comic company the way a comic company should be made. So he's down there in Florida, not that that has anything to do with anything, but he uh, basically is going to put a foot forward in terms of making comics, keeping the price point relatively static. And, I, you know, this is a, a take I haven't heard before in all the different interviews of the, the articles I've read, the people I've talked to. But if you follow how tech companies get started, startup companies get started, they typically have a little bit of a business plan. They have a value prop chart and they have something that they're aiming toward. They typically, uh, as startups, do this thing where they get some VC, some financier money, or maybe they've got an angel investor or somebody who's just super rich putting it together. And they kind of come up with a business plan that usually involves losing a ton of money from anywhere to five to eight years before they're going to do a hockey stick and become very, very valuable by kind of maximizing their revenue, uh, you know, either through subscriptions or, you know, people are, are subscribed or, you know, they've subscribed a longer term to the service or they've uh, found, uh, you know, uh, they basically created a bunch of patents or IP that somebody else is going to buy. If you live in the Silicon Valley or in the Pacific Northwest, this happens all the time where companies kind of patent troll, they get some IP and they sell off to a Google, a Microsoft, a Facebook. They get something that's kind of tempting for them. They patent it up so it can't be easily replicated, although it's a bit of a gamble when you do that. And, uh, you know, and then they get bought and everybody makes a lot of money. CrossGen felt like that. The business model was that they were going to go seven years or so losing money. They were going to try and build a really solid foundation of titles. They were going to, you know, get those picked up by entertainment companies. And then they were going to make a ton of money off the back end. It's sort of the kind of model you hear today about comics wanting to get that Hollywood money, sell off to Netflix and everything else. But CrossGen was founded on that premise and it was founded by somebody with $30 million in his pocket, ready to really, you know, kind of, you know, make a ton of cash. So it, it starts out, you know, relatively strong. It, it, uh, they, they do a preview issue. They get a couple comics out there. Uh, more than a couple of comics, actually. It, what's funny about CrossGen is it published a ton of books. Uh, Mystic, Sigil, Scion, uh, The First, Meridian, Crux, Sojourn, 
all those titles uh, got more than 30 copy, uh, 30 you know issues in the bank. Uh, and they were they were going really strong. Uh, launched in January of 2000, and they they had a, a pretty good run till about 2002 2003, when it all fell apart. Now, before we get to why it fell apart, uh, the other thing that they did, which was pretty progressive and interesting at the time, is they they put people on salary. So they offered creators you know health insurance and dental plans, and they they put people actually on salary. When you have you know, $30 million, you got a big bankroll, it makes sense to do that. You bring people in a little bit closer, you have a little bit more control over things, and you have people who are employees, not freelancers. And there's a handful of people who were pretty excited by this. Um, you had, you know, Gina Villa, who was head of creative, um, and then you had uh, Ron Mars, Barbara Kessel, Mark Wade. Um, you had a ton of creative talent, Steve McNiven, Bart Sears, Jim Chung, Brandon Peterson, um, you, you had uh, Pearson, what is it, uh, Peterson, um, you had a, a lot of pretty top talent on these books and, uh, and early in their careers, which was, again, if you're thinking like a tech company, this is what you want to do. You want to kind of have some people on staff, you want to pay them well, you want to have them, you know, have health insurance, you want to have this kind of model. And you're going to create a very tight knit closed group. You're going to have you're, what you're going to be worried about is that you put some effort and investment into somebody, a talent, a writer, an artist, whatever, and they're going to go off and they're going to work for a different bidder. That's, that's uh, you know, tech companies uh, basically not just paid salary, but had good benefits, had a, a giant kitchen with food. It's funny because people bring up uh, the food. So one of the things that, <laughs> that Mark Alessi did in the office there in Florida was they had a giant uh, stocked, you know, kitchen with lunches and food, which is, again, it's commonplace in tech, but it's not commonplace in comics. And the idea there is that you're going to show kind of employees loyalty and you're going to expect a ton of loyalty in return. Well, you know, a number of things kind of happened that went, uh, that, that definitely went awry. So uh, first off, uh, you know, and this is one of those pieces that kind of comes up again later, but Mark Alessi's wife uh, dies. Uh, she, she passes on pretty early in the, the company's history. And that that's, you know, I, I put it this way, it's, it's distracting. Of course it's distracting. Now he's got to take care of his child. And it was a, um, you know, it was a devastating event for him. It would probably be, uh, it, it probably took a lot of, of, of his energy and his, his um, enthusiasm for the whole business away. And on top of that, um, members of his own staff were uh, not the nicest to his wife, let's say. There, there were a number of reports of some of the writers uh, who would kind of be rude to her or make a pass at her, just just do, do kind of gross, slimy things to his wife. And then, of course, his wife dies kind of midstream, and it, uh, it, 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 was, it was bad. Um, Alessi was also what I would call a very typical uh, startup tech kind of personality. Um, he was tough. Um, some, so depending on your point of view, he was either kind of maniacal in how he was nice one day and then crazy angry the next day, or he was just a raging asshole, depending on who you're talking to. Um, he was notoriously kind of hard or brutal, which uh, depending on, again, your point of view. And the problem is it's hard to really drill down whether he was uh, truly, like if you, if you compared him to your average tech startup boss, probably it looks very, very similar. But for comics and the comic industry, in particular, a lot of freelancers who are, you know, I, I think are enamored and like the idea of being on salary, really haven't had much experience with that and typically write their own rules. It was a, a massive personality conflict. It's, it's the, if you're, uh, if you're in tech and you're doing some of these other pieces and then suddenly you come into comics, it, uh, you know, it, 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 it's just, it could be a culture clash. And, and it absolutely, absolutely was. Um, but, uh, you know, as he's getting into it and as he's experiencing what it's like to run a comic company and try and put people on salary who are not used to being on salary and are very temperamental, um, it is you know, a lot of people crazy acted out. One of the, the legendary stories that, that I think has recently kind of come out and swirled around over the last two years is Mark Wade, who was, uh, you know, employed there at the time going nuts and like punching holes in walls and, and having kind of, you know, regularly scheduled meltdowns. 
uh, which, you know, again, depending on your point of view, was just kind of quirky comic personality stuff, or was, you know, just insane sociopathic, you know, bad behavior. Um, it, it is, it, it's a true statement is it's just kind of an aside. As I've gotten to know a lot of people in comics, as I've gone to a lot of cons over the years, uh, the comic creators act out in pretty big, pretty bold ways. Not all of them, but in my no stretch of the imagination, all of them. But there is this kind of tolerating behavior where even, you know, normal, well put together comic creators will watch their peers, others, go on crazy, boisterous, you know, drunken rants. And if that person has any kind of clout or standing inside the company, um, nobody, everybody's afraid to say anything. And so, I mean, like, you know, you had, you had Mark Wade, you had Rod Mars in CrossGen and both had, you know, tons of stories about kind of some pretty, pretty outrageous behavior. I mean, it, it is, uh, you know, it, it, it was kind of a, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff there that you just, do not, uh, you, you wouldn't see in another company or somebody would just get punched in, in the face over. I mean that, you know, it, it just, it, it is, uh, it, you had a lot of these kinds of things. Uh, Ron Mars was one of the people who had, um, apparently made a lot of really crass comments uh, to his wife. Um, and, and then of course, when his wife died about a year later, uh, that just made it all much, much worse, of course. So, um, about the time that Alessi's wife dies, uh, his money, you know, he didn't take the 30 million and just, you know, have it in cash. He had it in stock and the stock was in Perot systems and there was an energy manipulation scheme. And I think the tank, the stock basically went down about 90% of its value. I mean, just some out outrageous amount of money. And so suddenly that $30 million you had as security money and the, you know, the plan of, you know, go seven years losing money before you have that hockey stick up, um, it, it vanished. That, that whole about of money just, just evaporated. So now they start missing checks. Uh, they start having some financial difficulties. Again, if you're in a tech startup, you may have these bumps. You, uh, there's, you know, many companies, friends I know, they've got companies that are from angel investors. The angel investors have a bad you know, month on the market. And it's like, hey, we need to be late on your salary for two months. This is, this is again, I want to say normal because nobody likes this and, and nobody wants to have their, their money. I'm not saying at all it's normal in stock to, in, in tech to not get paid, but there, it's not, it's not abnormal either. It's, it's, it's not a good thing, but it's an understood thing. When I say understood, again, I, I'm not saying the employees put up with it. I'm just saying it's not like this, this crazy never heard of before thing. But perhaps because it was the 90s and coming out of all the turmoil and the chaos, um, or perhaps it was just, you know, that, that these were people in the comic industry who were used to kind of freelance comics and, and were not used to salary and then were not used to kind of riding the stock wave with that salary, uh, they revolted. And then there was a lot of hurt feelings and, and angriness uh, all over the place. And people started throwing stuff left and right. Um, Alessi definitely has a, a ton of bitter feelings about the people he hired. Um, the books all kind of got suddenly canceled midstream, uh, sometimes in the middle of storylines. And then Disney buys them for a million dollars back in 2004. And at, at first it looked like that was going to be a lifeline, but then Disney had no idea what to do with it. Remember, this is several years before they bought Marvel. And Disney at times has done what they call, what I'll call uh, speculative purchases with the intent to understand how another purchase is going to get made. Now, I've never said this, any, or I've never heard this anywhere. However, looking at Blue Sky, uh, which is Disney's investment firm, and some of how Disney's done investments in the past, they at times will buy on the cheap a company for very little money and then use that as a way to kind of understand uh, the IP and the licensing and kind of understand the mechanism. And then they'll spend, if it goes well, more money for the company they really want and kind of bury their initial acquisition. Now, I'm not saying that was their, their plan for cross-gen necessarily, but that is how it played out. Uh, Joe Casada has come back out in, in, you know, in, in, in recent times and kind of talked about how it will get revived. They did a, a very short-lived revival in like 2010 or 11 that didn't go anywhere. Unfortunately, the titles, uh, the time had passed. Uh, there were the, the other thing that kind of hit it that was uh, unfortunate is that there were a bunch of movie deals swirling. And I think 
with the money running out and kind of the creator starting to revolt and Alessi, you know, kind of losing his mind, uh, good and bad over some of the behavior that was going on with some of these creators. And, and I, I want to make it clear. I'm not saying, oh, creators bad, Alessi good. Uh, Alessi's uh, personality was, was not, uh, you know, is, is not a healthy one. I mean, he, he did things that uh, many, many sources have said were just kind of you know, crazy behavior to people. And a lot of people in the comments undoubtedly will have more. So I'm just, I'm just kind of hitting the surface. I want to wrap this up actually pretty soon. We'll do another video on some of the other parts to this, but it was, um, it, it just, it, it was like dominoes falling. And I think you, you took two worlds that shouldn't have mixed and tried to mix them. And of course the personalities did not fit anything else. Um, it definitely exposed a lot of ugliness in it. Um, I think, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of the story that a lot of people have heard is, um, when, uh, when, when the company finally, you know, basically tanked or when it was, when it was over, um, after announcing the bankruptcy, uh, an employee that was fired, uh, Mark Wade sends a black wreath to, uh, Alessi saying, wouldn't your dead wife be proud of you now? And again, keeping in mind that, his wife dying of a heart attack very suddenly happened at a very kind of pivotal moment, happened really right before the stock tanked and everything went wrong. Uh, but it was already, he was already having a very hard time with some of the creators, some of the outbursts and, and everything else that was going on. Um, again, whether you, you like Alessi or, or not, uh, that was a, a pretty low class moment in comics. And, but it was indicative of kind of the personality type of some creators who viewed this stuff as, you know, you know, I, I would just, just in a very crass kind of way. It's why, um, it's why the industry I think is reacting so, uh, aggressively against, uh, you know, the people who are calling it out, whether they be from on the, uh, Warren Ellis side or whether it being the, the comics gate side, or there's a bunch of different groups that are calling out comics and there's this kind of very angry immediate backlash against it. And I think part of it is that, um, you know, a lot of the creators recognize this, you know, kind of this behavior. And if they even smell a whiff of it, that's similar to things they've done in the past, they, they get very angry, very defensive, uh, the usual suspects, some of these names. I mean, the reality is, and, and, um, I mean, again, I, I there are going to be people who agree, disagree with me. It's, it's fine. I just think that for some people, um, maybe you, you're not able to control yourself. Maybe you, you know, you have a personality type that's, that's slightly toxic or manic or whatever it happens to be. And it's a shame. It's bad. You know, you got to know your limits and everything else. Um, but those personality types, uh, shouldn't be the ones who are kind of calling to the carpet, other people in the industry for good or bad behavior. You know, it's, it's, it'd be like, uh, if you get somebody who's, a you know, a, an arsonist, somebody who's, you know, and you put them in charge of the fire department. Um, it's like, on one hand, you could say, well, this person really understands fire. On the other hand, you could say, you know, that that's, that's insane. And you, you put that person in jail. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, I don't know. It's it cross gen is such an interesting, like I said, it's, it's a hard topic to go through because in many ways, I think they set a structure for a company that was a good idea. They did the right things. And then, um, there, but they did a lot of the right things with some of the wrong people and with the wrong expectations. And it was a case where you had one person who wanted to run a business one way. You had a bunch of employees who kind of wanted to, uh, you know, were not used to working in a business that way, didn't want to work in a business that way. You had that coming together in a pretty, pretty kind of nasty combo. And then you had a bad, a, a bad luck, you know, the unfortunate passing of his wife, the stock tanking, the Hollywood uh, stuff just kind of spiraling around for years without any real pickup. So they never got their, their big moment. And, um, you know, and then Disney buying them on the cheap for a million dollars. I mean, think about it. I, I mean, $1 million to buy this company, all of its properties after everything that was set up is pretty nuts. Uh, I mean, I, I know there's a bunch of people listening to this right now who, who could have bought CrossGen. Um, I mean, that's, that's crazy. But I'll do another video to go more into the titles, more into the other things. It, it is one of those stories that's like a, you'd spend an hour on it. And some people have. There's a lot of videos. There's a lot of other people who've, who've done their comments on it. I want to kind of take it from the perspective of, of kind of company cultures and when they come together wrong. And it is, I, I think, you know, I, I having, having heard the Mark Wade story many, many times before, the Ron Mars story, others, um, it, you know, that's one of the things I wanted to actually talk to Ron Mars about. Uh, it is, it is a case where 
you, you know, you want to hear the other side. I'd like to hear the other side to this because it certainly seems like some pretty nasty behavior. Um, you know, what were people thinking? That would be a good thing to do. But anyway, CrossGen had some great stuff. Definitely a lot of fan love. It did engender a lot of uh, deep, deep love, I think, for their properties. And it's a shame that it, it went the way it went. Uh, I, I think, you know, those properties be hard to revive now. But, you know, I wish they would. Uh, it is it is a lot of good ideas there. And a lot of the, the you know, some bad luck, you know, wrong people kind of wrong approach. Uh, the industry wasn't ready for it yet. Unfortunately, I was, I was thinking about this before I started recording. It's like if, if CrossGen had just come around 15 years later, you know, would it work? And the answer is probably no. Unfortunately, a lot of the psychologies, a lot of the behaviors uh, are the same today as they were then. Uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's, there's some lessons in there about how to run a company and also kind of the creators involved within it. Um, and we're going to get to those in some future videos. But anyway, I, I wanted to just touch on the surface, give you a little bit of a brain dump on CrossGen. I know some of you have been asking for it. So there you go. Uh, that's kind of the highlight of what's going on. Again, lots of people in the comments who probably don't, you know, are not going to last this long. The video are going to go on and on about, uh, you forgot about this, this, and this. Yes, absolutely. And, and there's no way you could go into everything in this company's history and all the ins and outs in 20 minutes. Uh, but, uh, you know, you got to start somewhere, right? So... That's where we're at. Anyway, uh, ask your questions below. I'm gonna. I'm planning on spending a lot more time with CrossGen and really talking about some of the details there. So if you'd like me to hit upon some of those, you know, leave a comment below. Let me know, and and I will try and hit it all over time. So more to come. Anyway, like, subscribe, click the bell for notifications. Shoot me an email. Follow me on social media. My email is comics with an S. Perch at gmail.com. Most importantly, though, thanks for listening.